As 2022 wraps up, we look back at the top defense stories of the year and stories to watch for 2023. Aaron Mehta is Editor-in-Chief of Breaking Defense, Marcus Weisgerber is Global Business Editor for Defense One, and Leo Shane is Deputy Editor for Military Times. Gentlemen, welcome. Thanks for having us. Aaron, I'm going to start with you. Russia invaded Ukraine in February. I'm going to guess that's the biggest defense story of the year. Yeah, and I don't think it's particularly close. Uh, there were a lot of plans heading into this year about how the Defense Department and uh, the U.S. government as a whole were going to kind of focus on China, uh, make that the big push in terms of national security. And come February, that just went out the window. Uh, it's, it's safe to say that the Ukraine situation, Russia's decision to invade, the fact that Ukraine has managed to hold them off as long as they have, and in fact, reclaim territory at this point, uh, is probably one of the biggest defense uh, single events that we've seen probably since 9-11. And how has the Pentagon pivoted as a result of that? How has strategy changed or been adjusted? Yeah, we're seeing things uh, like, you know, referring to Russia as the acute threat. They're still trying to keep a focus on China for the long term in terms of how they're investing, in terms of technology development, things like that, hypersonic weapons. But ultimately, the Pentagon has had to focus on supporting the war that's going on right now. And that means focusing on production of ammunition, munitions, trying to get more equipment sent to Ukraine, trying to drive partners and allies to give more as well. Well, let's talk about that equipment, Marcus. A lot of military aid has been sent to Ukraine. Talk about the evolution of the types of weapons being sent. Well, we've seen early on, we saw, we saw stuff like anti-tank weapons and stuff that was just to, you know, blunt a Russian offensive. But as time has gone on, we've seen the sophistication of the weapons and the power, power of them increase. Of late, we've seen artillery go in. The HIMARS artillery has gotten a lot of press in recent weeks and months. Also, we've seen uh, uh, kamikaze-type drones come in. We've seen the Russians use kamikaze drones. We've seen the Ukrainians use them. The Ukrainians keep saying they want more and uh, more stuff with longer range. The U.S. has had a hesitance to do that for fear that they'll target stuff in Russia. There have been some reports that the U.S. is kind of geofencing, if you will, some of these weapons going in, but also some of the stuff we, uh, that we expect to continue to see is stuff like counter drone technology and also we have seen a, a ready counter missile technology like the NASAMS uh, missile defense system which uh, officials have told us have been incredibly accurate in shooting down Russian missiles. And Leo you follow Capitol Hill there's been strong support for Ukraine from uh, Congress this year what have Republicans signaled about next year when they take control of the House? Yeah, I mean, there's been strong support so far, but we'll see what's going to happen next year. We're getting a real mix uh, from House Republicans on whether or not that's going to continue. Uh, House Speaker Kevin, incoming House Speaker Kevin McCarthy has signaled that he might want to pull back some. There's a, a very conservative contingent of the, the House uh, Republican caucus that, that has said they think too much money has gone. On the Senate side, we have both Democrats and Republicans still saying, no, we're, we're totally committed here. We're going to have the money go in. So it's going to be a bumpy few months. I don't know if those, those large appropriations that we've seen are going to continue. And Aaron, I want to ask you about supply chain issues. Um, the ability of the Defense Department to replenish those stocks of munitions and weapons going to Ukraine. Yeah, well, and it's not just the Defense Department. We're hearing this from allies and partners in Europe as well, saying we are essentially at the point where we can't draw down anymore legally because we have our national stockpile requirements and we've given so many that we're now hitting that. Uh, we've had her from Norway, for instance, has said they're looking at changing their laws to be able to give more to Ukraine. The problem is people can only give so much before they're just out and there's only so many production lines available to actually build these things back up. And Marcus, what are, uh, on the defense industrial side, what are defense contractors telling you about that? So j just like Aaron said, we're actually hearing now people talk about new ways of producing weapons, stuff like co-production, actually standing up assembly lines closer to the battlefield. But even just ba back here in, in, the, in the United States, the defense industry for the past year and a half plus, pretty much all throughout COVID, has had three prime issues. Workforce issues, they can't find enough people to actually work. Um, uh, in the factory. They've had uh, the supply chain shortages and now inflation is driving the price of stuff like raw materials, wages, and even in factories in Europe, stuff like energy, the, you know, the, to heat and put electric in those buildings, driving it up. And Leo, you know, speaking of personnel, one of the biggest issues in that uh, sense was recruitment issues across the military services. Yeah, that's been a point of frustration all year. And as we're seeing, you know, a lot of this focus to the equipment and trying to figure out how to replenish and stuff, just getting the people in the door has become an issue. The Army missed its recruiting goals this year. The other services just barely got there. 
that's going to be an issue going ahead, too. How much are we going to see those recruiting issues continue? There's been a lot of pushback over whether or not that's just the economy. Is it some of these, um, you know, diversity, woke military issues, as we hear from the Republicans? Um, and then we actually saw it manifest in the last few weeks over uh, the, the vaccine mandate. Uh, about 8,000 people were booted out of the military for, uh, because, for refusing the COVID vaccine over the last year. Um, now the, the Congress is poised to roll that back to make sure that um, future recruits and future folks won't have to take the vaccine mandate. But will that help with recruiting? It's, it's unclear if that's going to really make a dent. And what happens to the 8,000? Will they be allowed to come back? Or... Not, not right now, but that's going to be one of the major pushes by Republican lawmakers next year. They've said that those folks should not only be allowed to come back, but they want to give them back pay as well. Democrats are saying, look, they refuse the lawful order. We can't have them come back. That just undermines things. So it's it's going to be a bumpy, going to be a bumpy 2023. And are the services telling you that 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 those recruitment and retention issues could affect readiness? They're, right now, they're saying they're they're on top of it, but it's not a hard uh, hard bridge to cross there to say that if they continue to have the recruiting issues, if they continue to start to to fail to get the right number of people in, that they're going to they're going to see shortfalls. So for now, they're they're saying we're fine, but. Two years of bad recruiting, three years of bad recruiting, that's not going to be the case. And Marcus, real quick, you know, that's that's obviously affecting on the uh, contractor side. It's a very tight labor market out there. It's, it is, and the, the defense industry is very much like the, you know, regular job or job labor market throughout the country. But specifically, defense companies are having trouble finding engineers, stuff like software engineers, and, and trades jobs, stuff like welders, which take years to train. Marcus, you alluded to this high inflation has been a big issue for consumers. How has it affected defense contractors? Well, it, just like consumers, it's, aff it's affecting the price of everything. Everything's being driven up. The question becomes, now it's costing more for companies to build weapons, no doubt. The question becomes, does the Pentagon make up for those increased costs? It's so far said, no, it's not. And it kind of seems like it'll probably down the road just make them up on future buys. For the big companies, that's fine. They have tons of liquidity. They're, they have tons of, you know, the, their, their accounts are very, very well stocked right now. But for small suppliers, the, the mom and pops who are making, you know, rivet, uh, rivets or bolts or something like that, that's not the case. They have fixed price contracts with the Lockheed Martins of the world, the Raytheons of the world, and they have to deliver. Now, if it's costing them to more money, it's up to, you know, the company to either you know, pay them or not pay them and then run the risk of them going out of business. So then they have to find somebody else to do it. And then you have supply chain issues. Correct. Leo, the National Defense Authorization Act, the NDAA, includes a 4.6% pay increase. Mm -hmm. That does that still doesn't make up for inflation. Yeah, look, it's the largest in 20 years. But as Marcus is saying, if costs are up, if your grocery <laughs> bills up, if your medical bills are up, that doesn't really cover it. So it's been a lot of conversation about how, how we look at military pay, how do we handle that. There's going to be a study uh, next year um, we'll see some preliminary results in April, but really looking at the entire military pay table, is the military pay system set up enough to respond to problems like historic inflation? Um, are there ways to do it differently? Do they need to just target some of the lower ranks? So, uh, you know, if you're... There, there was talk about making it progressive, so giving more to the lower ranks, less to the, uh, to the higher... That, that has been done in the past, but... Right now, the way we've been doing the calculations, the way the government has us set up, it's, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty strict formula. It's a pretty easy thing to follow each year. Again, troops see an increase every single year. That's not something that everyone in the private sector gets, so it's hard to argue that you know, there's a problem with the system. But Congress is at least going to look at it in light of, with all these rising family costs, are we still doing military pay right? And if you're inevitably going to, if that happens, you're inevitably going to have those in Congress who also say, if the troops are getting this much more money, then the weapons that, that we're buying for them, that should get equally plus up so the, the pay doesn't start crowding out those other accounts. And the defense budget is already pretty high. So at what point do you say, hey, we've gone way past what mm -hmm. we can afford as a country? Aaron, let's talk about a, another big story, which is Finland and Sweden applying for NATO membership. Is that going to happen in 2023? Yeah, I think it's likely to. You know, there's an expectation that right now uh, every country except Turkey and Hungary have approved Finland and Sweden to join NATO. Uh, the expectation is basically once Turkey says it'll do it, Hungary will do it pretty quickly. Both countries are holding out right now to get some concessions, uh, Hungary particularly on the EU side. Turkey's been trying to get some F-16s <laughs> from the U.S. Uh, for several years, which has been held up in Congress. So both sides say, hey, this is a chance for us to kind of make our power play, and they're trying to take advantage of it. At the same time, you talk to people from Finland and Sweden, uh, and there's an expectation that this will get done. Marcus, the Air Force unveiled the B-21 bomber, the Raider. 
Uh, what does it bring to the military, to uh, new capabilities? So I was out actually in Palmdale, California, in the desert a, a few weeks ago to go see the, the rollout of this new plane. And basically, we, we still do not know so much about what it can do because so much of that project is classified. From what, from what you know, the Northrop folks who are building it have told us, the Air Force has told us, it has a new new generation of stealth, uh, unlike the you know, the, an evolution, if you will, from what let's say the B two had, you know, when was when it was designed, you know, four four plus dec decades ago. So that's supposed to be a big thing. It's supposed to be able to do other missions like uh, intelligence, um, and it can uh, possibly down the road, it's probably going to be able to operate with or without a pilot inside. Well, we'll see in 2023. <clears throat> Leo, what's the biggest story you're going to be watching for next year? You know, the, the recruiting issue, as we talked about, is going to be one that we'll see going ahead. Um, one that I'm particularly tuned into is just the number of veterans in Congress we'll see next year. There's going to be an increase for the first time in about 10 years. Um, we're always promising that more veterans in Congress means that Congress is finally going to have more camaraderie and get along. So I'm sure that going into 2023, <laughs> everything will be fine and there'll be no real conflicts between the Republican-controlled House and the Democratic-controlled Senate. So. Okay. No, way to be optimistic. Aaron, what about you? What's the top story you're going to be watching? I mean, to me, it's continuing to follow from Ukraine and what that means for the Pentagon writ large. You know, there's Pentagon for three administrations now has been trying to pivot to Asia and that tends to be, uh, first it was undercut by the Middle East, now it's been undercut by situations in Europe. So how is the Pentagon going to manage to try to focus its uh, attention back on China, which they continue to say is the big threat going forward? And you hear that from the Biden administration down to lower levels of the Pentagon. Uh, but there's an ongoing war, and it's an important one for the U.S. to be supporting and, and assisting in. How they balance that is going to be, I think, one of the key stories the next year. And, and how much support that they're going to continue to have. And that comes back to the Congress question, because we're already seeing, as Leo pointed out, uh, Speaker McCarthy is, is throwing some barbs out there. We're going to see how that shakes out. I think there is a sense there's been polls done showing widespread support for supporting Ukraine, including among Republicans. Uh, I think the fact that their House has got such a thin majority and that the Senate remained in Democratic hands probably means that things will be OK for Ukraine. But we're going to have to find out. And Marcus, you get the last word. What are you watching? So I've said it a lot today, but supply chain inflation and, and workforce, you know, d d d how do these issues continue to impact defense companies? And w one thing is also, do defense cap companies and even the Pentagon and just government as a whole do they do they are they able to attract maybe some of these folks from commercial tech who have been laid off in in, rec in recent months? You know, I've talked to folks and, and they, they said, you know, we we need to do a better job attracting people into this sector. Well, now you have a, a bunch of people who you might not have had access to in the past. All right, Marcus, Aaron, Leo, thanks so much. It's nice talking to you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss out on any future Government Matters interviews.